So welcome to the talk. This is uh, From Zero to Hero with HTTP APIs. I've been going through in my mind a lot what to do in this talk and um, come up with this agenda. First, I want to tell you what's in it for you. Because after all, we all go to some talks and uh, maybe they don't fit everyone. Um, but just to start out, why would it fit you? Then uh, I'll show you some of the HTTP protocol. Uh, why Suave? So uh, a bit of background. Suave is the web server I'll primarily talk about. But this is actually a talk also about community and about building this open source software. So it's a deeply personal experience which I'm trying to share to you today. Um, it's built a community. And in this community, we've found patterns that work, software that works. So I'll show some of those. I'll give some links how to get started and um, tell you some about the future of Slav. First of all, uh, let's start out by um, a raising of hands. How many people here have heard of Slav or used it? That's nice. So about 40%. Um, for the rest of you, uh, let me give you first a brief introduction. What is it? Well, it's something about HTTP and also me. Um, I'm Henrik Felt. Uh, I'm uh, at HAF on uh, GitHub and Twitter. I'm Henrik Felt. Uh, I'm pretty prolific when it comes to open source software. So I've written a few libraries. Uh, Suave is one, um, together with Adamar. Expecto, a testing framework. Loggery, logging and metrics as one for .NET, F Sharp and C Sharp. HTTPFS, which is a wrapper around uh, HTTP web request. Uh, some minor libraries um, for, for example, talking to console, a key value store, uh, building with Ruby on .NET, Albacore, uh, etc. I'm also running a startup called Quitu. Quitu.com is uh, trying to automate bookkeeping for everyone to make it really easy to run your own business. That's what I've been doing the last three years. And we actually have um, Rasmus here with us today, working with us. So why would you listen to this talk? Maybe you're functionally curious. You're interested in what F# -sharp could bring to the table for your organization, or even just you as a developer. Maybe you're interested in web server construction. Or maybe you want to free yourself from heavy-handed web frameworks, frameworks that sort of build you into themselves and then leave you stuck there. All of those things, you'll get a, get a hunch about how to fix or free yourself from today. First of all, let's look at HTTP, because that's what all of this is going to be based around. It was invented in 1989, uh, sort of, by Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, he was working at CERN and invented it as an information retrieval system. He wanted to share research with other scientists. Uh, quite a bit later, everything was standardized and formalized. So the Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, and W3C uh, released RFC 2068 in 1997. That was the formal specification for HTTP 1.1. Uh, but even before then, we had had Netscape, and we had had Internet Explorer and the browser wars, and people had started to discover what the Internet could be. They had started to get a, a feeling of what was to come. In um, 1999 and 2014, the protocol was further refined and the bug fixes basically added to the RFCs. And now in 2015, we've got an HTTP 2.0, um, the latest protocol based on a proprietary one called Speedy from Google, uh, but also informed by uh, Microsoft's um, similar protocol. This is the basics. I'm sure you all have seen it. You have a user, and you have a server, and it's request response. It's layered on top of TCP, which means that it's um, uh, using already existing foundations. It's a stateless protocol. So in and of itself, it doesn't contain any state, but you can layer it on top of HTTP. So you can add cookies, and you can add session state on the server. And that's a pretty common pattern when you build uh, web frameworks or libraries. It's also built to be idempotent. And what that means is that when you apply a function more than once, you should have the same output as if you've just applied it once. So if you do a GET request to uh, an endpoint on an HTTP server, then you should have the same result, both GETs. Uh, 
Um, there are exceptions from this, uh, for example, post requests or um, uh, delete requests. Uh, but primarily post requests, they aim to change some state, and then you don't expect it to be idempotent. Um, so what about Suave as an HTTP server? Uh, so for me, it was about developer happiness. I wanted something that I would feel happy with building functionality in, something that would reduce my development friction and enable me to produce software more rapidly. I also wanted to create something that was community-driven. This question lingered in my head. Is it possible to compose a web server? When I came to Suave, um, it wasn't widely used, but it was already existing. Ademar Gonzalez is the other co-author of Suave. He lives in Toronto now and uh, works in Bitcoin startups. So he had made all the foundations. And what I needed was a web server that I could deploy for a microservice architecture when I was working uh, with a software development team. And we were under pressure to deliver. But I also wanted to apply my previous history, which I'll go through in a little while. Uh, but because I wanted a microservices architecture, I wanted to have a low memory and fast enough web server. And I wanted to free myself from the IIS trap where you were sort of stuck there and then everything would have to go through the GUI. I wanted something that was uh, close to the code, close to the metal, as they say. I also wanted something where I could onboard people and teach them how to program effectively. And I wanted something that could make sense both for, be for beginners and advanced programmers. Cross-platform was something I wanted because we started the microservices architecture in a similar vein as all the other architectures with Linux and Windows uh, co-hosted uh, in the same cloud. So we needed something that could uh, run as um, API utility servers next to Linux services. The transparent development process came afterwards. First and foremost, uh, these needs were mine to fulfill. But uh, after running this for a couple of years, the development process has uh, actually turned quite neat. Finally, one item is to encourage .NET devs, um, people like yourselves, to step outside of your comfort zones. Suave is uh, quite minimal. So you can read through the code in a sitting. Um, maybe in four hours, you can read through all of the code of Suave. That makes it easy to, to onboard, and it makes it easy for you to, to start to investigate uh, what it would require to build infrastructure. Because I, as a C-sharp developer, when I started this project, never wrote infrastructural code. I always used the frameworks, and I always used the available libraries uh, published by authorities. This is what it looks like, hello world, in Suave. And it's actually um, actual F-sharp compiled. This framework is running on Suave. It's called FS Reveal. So it's uh, an adaptation of Reveal.js that lets you write markdown for slides. And then it also compiles F-sharp to these nice tooltips. Suave works around web parts, which is the basic uh, building block. Just to understand what Suave does, doesn't require you to fully understand what a web part is. But it's enough to understand that you can compose them with this fishy thing. Um, so you got web parts like get that filters requests. And then you have web parts like path that also filter. And then if those don't match, then it can continue to another web part further down the application. Finally, you have uh, output web parts like redirections or successful output. Uh, in this case, we have Suave successful OK. And it takes a string, converts it to bytes in UTF-8, and then outputs it to the socket that you have the client on. So when you look at the HTTP protocol, uh, this is what it could look like when you do a hello world. I've spawned the server locally, and um, I'm making a get request. It starts here on line four with uh, the verb get and the path hello. It also contains the protocol that the client is using. Uh, the host user accept and um, user agent headers are required. Uh, well, technically not the user agent, um, but accept and host are the minimal requests you can create. In response, you, you get the, um, the protocol chosen, 
you get the server, the date, uh, and the content type, and also the content length. So down here you can see that uh, world was outputted. You could look at the relationships between the different protocols like this. Everything is running on Ethernet, switching, um, the basic uh, stock hardware. On top of that, you have uh, IP, which provides addressing. You also have addressing in Ethernet uh, via the MAC addresses, but you need a way of, of decoupling the physical hardware from the logical network address, so there you have IP. On top of IP, you have UDP and TCP, like you know. TCP is the uh, most commonly used protocol for HTTP. So uh, it gives you guaranteed delivery of packages, but not messages. That means you can have terminated connections, you can have partial requests, and you can have lost messages as well. So uh, while we do get replayability of packages uh, and reordering of them uh, with TCP, we don't necessarily get all the messaging features that you'd expect from a broker like RabbitMQ or Kafka. On top of TCP, then, is HTTP. Uh, so HTTP 1 uh, creates a socket and then uh, makes a request and, and the client gets a response. Further up, you have web sockets and server sent events. How many here have heard of server sent events? Raise a hand. And of, okay, so about 30%. And uh, web sockets? Almost everyone. Let me explain the difference. When you look at an HTTP request, it's transparent because it's plain text. You can write a curl command and you can see the actual output of it. That's because the headers are sent as ASCII, and if you just have a text HTML body, that also is sent as at least UTF-8. With WebSockets in comparison to SSC, um, you got this. You make a request, and as a response you get a text slash event stream. That's still plain text. And what server sent events do um, is that they make the socket remain open, and then you can push data as you go. You can then do a curl command, and you can see uh, data being outputted over time. You could also call this half duplex, like uh, one of those modems that had to be silent when the other side was communicating with it. WebSockets, on the other hand, um, they're full duplex. But first, let's look at uh, what, it could say, uh, what you could do with uh, just server sent events. A small chat example. This also showcases a bit of uh, the Suave API. Primarily, the function that starts the web server called start the web server. It gets uh, configured with a Suave config that you can set up yourself. In the Suave config, you have things like binding. Uh, what network, network interface do you want to bind to, what port, and uh, how many concurrent operations should you have, what, what buffers should you have, etc. Then what the small hat thing here means uh, after Suave config is that everything that comes after this hat is one value, particularly one web part. So previously I showed you the composition of get, path, OK. That was one web part. Um, Choose and its arguments, that's also one web part. So what choose does is that it iterates through the different alternatives, and the moment one says that I'm going to reply to the request, choose also returns. So it's uh, like a select statement for uh, K events or um, IO completion ports. So first we see if we it matches the API, and then if it doesn't, we always serve the index HTML page. This is a very common pattern when you build single page applications, because you want to serve so that the JavaScript can do the routing in the browser using the history API. Finally then, if nothing matches here, which is a bit strange, because we've compiled and built the site, so we should have an index file, then we serve internal error, because we have some sort of programming error here. This is an example of what the um, chat API can look like. So we want to say that we always serve JSON. We also serve UTF-8. This is a common mistake when people start out with HTTP, that they don't actually specify UTF-8, and then the browsers interpret it as the default for the operating system in question that the client is running on. 
Beyond that, we have uh, three endpoints, send, messages, and subscribe. We also have some global state. So I remember when I was uh, doing ASP.NET, and there was this big, big question about how do I keep something long running on the side? And you would read this advi the advice and say that, well, you can use MSMQ, and then you can create a Windows service, and you have to go and read about the Windows service. And everything was very, very um, intricate. Because if you created something on ASP.NET, uh, like a thread running in the background, the guidance was that this thread may be killed at any point. So you ran into the problem of your app may not work, and you'll never know when it doesn't work unless you capture the global error handler and look at the thread abort exception. And that only happens every four days. So, yeah. Good old days. But like you can see here, <coughs> Instead, we have um, let API equals. So everything that comes after, everything from 199 to uh, 209, that's something which is statically initialized, like a global variable. Oh no, you say. Those are evil. They are to some extent. But when you build distributed systems, what you want to do is you want to push all the subscription and metadata information to a database or some sort of broadcast layer in the background. And there's nothing wrong in initializing your resources for your application statically, if your application is the only holder of those resources. So what we're doing is that we're actually initializing the hub. This is very similar to SignalR. Uh, because we have a hub and spoke architecture. In this demo, we only have a singular hub. We don't actually have um, a persistent pub sub um, backend. So it's enough for us to initialize it statically like this. Let's look at the first path here sending of messages. What we're doing then is to deserialize the command that came in, the chat message and then passing that along to this other function called broadcast. I know this looks quite advanced, but once you get into the feeling of it, it, it feels quite natural. The pattern is that whenever you have some resource which is either configuration or statically initialized, you just pass it as initial arguments. And whatever you get back, that's a function. And that function can be called by the request. So that function then is what your request acts upon. And all the previous arguments, all the configuration and the hub and, and everything like that, the things you use IOC for in C-sharp, those are just parameters, and back you get the configured function. So in this case, I'm initializing the hub because it's a global, so it's something you'd otherwise put in the IOC container, and it just takes one line of code. We also see another pattern here, which is deserialize which then passes the deserialized command into the um, broadcast function. So the function return from calling broadcast with the hub. This is what it could look like when you want to push data from the API. So as we move towards the future, our APIs are becoming more and more live. It's not enough to pull using a read model in the database anymore, but the user may want to be directly and instantly notified when something happens. Let me walk you through this. It's using a pattern which originates from ML, which is to take the um, stateful type T as the first parameter. If you remember here, we're passing the hub to the subscribe function. That's the first parameter here. So we don't need to um, we don't need to care about this implementation. We just have some handle to some stateful thing. And now we can work with it. The stateful thing is then um, talked to using the public API of that stateful thing, which is the um, thing that uses messages in this code. Namely, uh, there, source tap messages. The rest is just a loop that continuously consumes messages and then send them on the event source. And this could be equivalently done using WebSockets. So WebSockets work like this. It's full duplex. 
And that means that you have a uh, request which contains a specific header called upgrade. That part is plain text. But when you um, get the response back, it uh, has been upgraded to a binary format, something which you not, not necessarily can expect. Uh, inspect, sorry. Uh, or expect if you're a reverse proxy, perhaps. But it also allows you to pass messages as you're receiving them. Uh, so you can build your API as part of the WebSocket connection. And then you go into the quandary, uh, should I have post endpoints or should I have WebSocket endpoints? As you can see from the code sample, I'm a big fan of having actual HTTP endpoints for things that we want the HTTP semantics for. We may want item potency. We may want to have um, request IDs. And we want to handle them using headers, um, version numbers, optimistic concurrency control, session cookies, etc. And then you can use WebSockets to push read models, data that you continuously create on the server side, or service end events. I wanted to go through my story because the building of this framework has been a lot about my own personal experience and my, um, my journey towards it. Back in 2003, I was uh, devouring this patterns and practices, how to build NTR apps. Um, back then, I didn't have a Visual Studio. I was actually coding in Dreamweaver. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I did have a takeaway there, uh, something about forces. The forces were the things you wanted to consider when building software applications. Um, they mentioned things like you wanted to minimize uh, the changes required, you wanted uh, reuse of components, uh, cohesive components, and performance at some points. Those were the forces you had to consider. Um, then the year afterwards came Evans, uh, Eric Evans, with his book Domain Driven Design, Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software. And I remember I was sitting down at the, uh, at the uh, bay and uh, sitting in the sunshine, drinking a good latte and uh, reading this book end to end. And it was the most relevatory experience I have ever had as a programmer because I came from these patterns and practices um, which I really didn't understand how to generate a data set with. And then suddenly, oh, it can be a repository instead. Wow. And it can be only code. That was also amazing. But the big takeaway I had from that book until my future self was actually the le leather jacket. That when you wear a leather jacket, then as you wear it and you move about like this, and you dance perhaps, um, you get points of suppleness, like in the elbows or up here on the shoulders, because that's where you move. And the rest is stiff and protects you. And you want to build software the same way. You want to build software that's supple in the right places, but otherwise guides you in the right direction. It also gave us a vocabulary for actually speaking about software, going beyond the, the, the exact code artifact names, like interface and class, and taking it up a level of abstraction. Um, so then I started with open source. And I started looking into castle transactions and, and uh, contributing a, a bit to it. You could, in a single sentence, say it was global linear reliability through aspect-oriented programming. How many people use that? <laughs> it's a bit opaque. Um, what it means is that we want to guarantee correctness. And the aspect-oriented programming part was that when you had a method, you could wrap it in a transaction, similar to how Spring transactions did it if I'm not completely mistaken. But the problem with that is that it's opaque. When you have some transaction going on around your method, you're not really sure you're in a transaction. So you have to look at transaction scope and then context current and see if there is a transaction. But what if it's a nested transaction? Ah, damn it, you're lost again. And then also, MDSN has actually uh, parent-child transactions that can run in parallel. How many people have used those? <laughs> so it was a great learning experience. And for the camera, no one actually put up their hand there. It, learned, it sort of taught me the importance of quality. Um, 
in order to understand these transactions, I had to understand the underlying transaction paradigm. And then I had to understand relational databases. And then I had to understand distributed relational databases and so on. So that's sort of how I got my shove into distributed systems. So just for future reference, strict serializability means um, that you have multiple entities, like multiple rows in a table, and um, you have multiple transactions as well. And they all run so that each program observes some uh, sequence of events, readings and writings from the database or, and or tables, um, which corresponds to a uh, particular execution of that program as it were single-threaded. That's what transactions is supposed to give you. But it was opaque. And uh, like with ORMs, you never knew what you read. And plus, you, you, you lower the transaction level to, uh, with no lock, just so the report could be finished. Um, but in 2006, then, I started with Haskell, um, actually because I started university. And um, I learned that you could separate state from logic, because previously, especially in the DDD book, which was quite object-oriented, you always put the logic into the entities and the aggregate roots. So now you had to intermingle the logic and the state. Uh, which turned out to be hard when, when people and myself were designing applications with it. Because you, you really didn't know how you ended up in that state, and then if something went wrong, you had to sort of execute on the database manually. Uh, but with Haskell, you separated them instead. Um, so you had logic and state on one hand side, and in the Haskell side, you had logic that flows data. So data moves through the logic instead. And then if you have patterns, uh, you make them type classes. So instead of classes, you make them a type class, and that's then the pattern that you're reusing uh, when it comes to flowing the data. Um, in 2007 and 2008, this book came out. Just before then, it was only FS Fish and um, um, strange uh, hash light at the top of the FS files. But at this point, with F Sharp 2.0, it started to become readily available in Visual Studio, and I became F Sharp curious. I also discovered that maybe there is a, is, on this slide, maybe there is a way to write code that's correct by construction. And I started looking into different sorts of type theories like Martin Love and like uh, dependent types and so on. But of course, F Sharp isn't that, but F Sharp gives you a lot more when uh, compared to C Sharp 2.0. Um, then I started consulting. I met Simon Peyton Jones, that was awesome. Um, I also read some books and now follow some books because at this point, books started to become a, a really interesting part. Of course, all of this aims to talk about how this library was constructed in the end. That's why I'm saying this. I just remembered I need to say that. Uh, but I read this anti-fragile book, which is about when you have complex systems, like software systems in this case, um, you want them to gain from disorder. They want to be anti-fragile. So a robust system is something like this table. I can hit it, and it sort of goes back to normal. Um, but myself, if I do, do push-ups or I do handstands, which I'm not going to show, then my muscles grow stronger and I gain from the disorder I create. I sort of destroy some muscle fibers, but in the end I get more of them. I also worked with mainframes. Um, in 2013, I joined an enterprise and I started looking into lean thinking books because that was really, really uh, what you start to think about when you join enterprises. Um, but it became more about analyzing humans um, when they, they act in software systems, because this enterprise in particular had quite large software systems. Uh, they had about uh, 200 huge customers with thousands and thousands of end users, and, and each had customizations and reports and, and things that made it very, very coupled to this particular version. So my nice migration scripts didn't work. Um, but then how do you sort of move forward in such an organization and continuously deliver value when you're always getting um, locked down? Because as systems grow, especially if they're monoliths, and especially if they don't have a culture of XP, extreme programming, continuous delivery, uh, continuous improvement, etc., then um, you hold off on releasing. And that, inc that spikes the risk rather than diminishing it. And then when something goes wrong, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that, oh, we should have tested it more. 
and then that in turn makes it even less frequent. Uh, so these books are really nice. Uh, Womack was one of the people in America that started doing lean um, in his... Um, yeah, how am I on time? Looking good? So anyway, 2015 I started my company, Q2. And I've asked myself the question, um, what was? Uh, what is? So where have I come at the moment? And where am I coming from? So we've gone through where I'm coming from now. And the question becomes what ought to be? What should the developer development experience, the business building experience, the software experience be for you people? The people who use my framework, Slav, to build software and deliver. A good book here is by Hock, One from Many, These Are the Rise of the Chaotic Organization, where they go through that if you just organize people around the idea of something, rather than organizing them by telling them things, you get a, um, a system that organizes itself. And that leads you to the pit of success. Because you want both that with people and with software. Could I just get a check on how many minutes I have left? Is it 10 minutes? How much? Half an hour left. <laughs> I was just... <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> then I can slow down. <laughs> so my point is then that Sov is sort of a movement. At least that's what it feels to me. Because I created it uh, on my own chamber with Adamar. Uh, we iterated on it. We tested it. We improved upon it. And now it's grown. People are using it in production. Um, FSNIP.net, we have uh, the Gamma was uh, initially written with it. We have people demoing the new Visual Studio with it. People are actually starting to pick up this software and using it. And I believe that's because uh, the thought that has gone into it. Because there is no single person or company that underwrites what Suave is. It's a community instead. The development process is completely open. It just exists, and you can choose to use it. I'm not going to push features on you. You can stay on an older version if you want. You can pull requests to older versions. So it's become sort of this adaptive, nonlinear human system, something that's self-organizing. And I think the, the biggest upside with it is that it, bring, it sort of guides you in the right direction towards something which, is, uh, which has low coupling, is cohesive, and bring you the properties you want from, um, from building software. It gives you the structure. And then it goes out of the way and lets you write your app. So one thing many people mention when it comes to functional programming is that, oh my god, it has to be immutable, then I can't change things, so what about the socket? In my, like, all of you have said that at some point, I'm sure. Because it becomes so hard to build systems when you can't change it. The world is, after all, changeable. The reason you have this conflict is that functional programming is actually uh, allowing you to change things underneath the hood. As long as your public API is immutable, then you're free to use as much immutability and as much performance optimizations as you want beneath the hood. A really good example of this is the parser called AttoParsec for Haskell, which actually has a very, very mutable buffer um, and lots of algorithms to grow and shrink it, and then outperforms C on HTTP parsing. I suppose you're getting a feeling now of where I want to take Suave in the future. So it hides the complexity and lets you focus on your building your application instead. This is our production code, and it showcases the Suave API for our API. You can see first that we try to find the static file requested. That's the um, happy path for all the static assets. And then it goes through the different API endpoints, including the interactive endpoints that um, aren't public, but rather something that the app uses or our logging framework, Loggery, uses. So Suave is one part of the F-Sharp story. The F-Sharp story, though, on the other hand, it's what ought to be. That's why I'm so happy to meet you guys today, because you're part of the F-Sharp story if you want to. You can choose to take the step towards being better software developers and furthering your knowledge. You can do that where you are right now, of course. It's not a contradiction. <laughs> 
But in the F-sharp community, we've actually gotten some steam and gotten some speed towards the goal of building really well-architected software. And it's community-driven. And it feels like such a breath of fresh air to me. Now let's dive a bit deeper into SAV and look at how it works. This is the connection handling. You see on the left-hand side, you've got the user. Um, here, is, here is you, uh, the programmer. You've got a nice beard. Uh, we have the bound socket here. That's the uh, thing that you bind on your VM. So a socket is the IP and the TCP endpoint. Uh, which is the, so, sorry, the TCP endpoint is the IP in the port. And you bind it, and you have a singular process listening to one of those, that tuple. So when the client connects, um, you have the syn of TCP, which you get synac back to, and then the request starts to happen. The data there is then the headers that you saw in one of the earlier slides. But the data is sent to a child socket, which has uh, an ephemeral port uh, in the high port range. So when you do netstat, you'll see one bound port, and then you'll see one ephemeral port um, for each client. The web part is written by you, so all the buffering and all, all the um, shrinking and growing and metrics and ensuring the HTTP is valid as a request happens before you get invoked. Uh, then you can execute, you can do asynchronous invocations to a database or to file systems or maybe zip a file on the fly as you stream that back to the client. Uh, so you get the data. And then if you either have connection close as a header, you close the connection, or you can have um, keep alive connections and then you can let the client continue to send requests to your API. In code, um, you first bound the listening socket. It's a socket type stream on the TCP protocol. And then for every TCP connection, you accept. So then you grab the client socket. Uh, you process the HTTP request. You can see the let bang. That's F sharp for saying, um, this is the happy path. And then if we have the sad path and something goes wrong, like we get a bad request, that's handled outside of this code. So you can handle it in one place. That's the decoupling again of logic. So you parse the request, you get the result, and then you, you keep it, um, uh, you put it into um, record and feed it to your web part, which can now execute and, and create a response. So we've seen the execution side. The other side is a different dimension. It's sort of orthogonal in this case, because you can choose to either return bytes or a socket task. In the initial hello world example, we said OK and then a string. That's get, that gets directly converted to some bytes. It's a pretty simple operation. But if you're zipping a file on the fly, you want to continuously stream that file because it can be big. So then you return instead a socket task, and you can be a part of the asynchronous sending to the browser. This is um, a discriminated union. And it's in the uh, HTTP output file in the Suave source code. And what the discriminated union means for the C-sharp developers is that it's either or. It's either the bytes or it's a socket task or it's a null um, reply. And then it, that's when you unit test, for example. Let me show you some patterns then. How do you use Suave in real life? This is, for example, how you add logging. So one of the open source frameworks I've released is called Loggery. It's a, a competitor to Serilog, but it also does metrics. That means that you can feed your um, application timers and uh, gauges and reservoirs, etc., into something like Influx or um, StatsD, or yeah, you get, the, you get the gist of it. And it gives you a functional interface as well. This is another pattern. It's called uh, the 12 factor app. If you haven't seen it, it's a really nice pattern for decomposing and analyzing software that you deploy. It's primarily a deployment pattern. But as it turns out in DevOps, it's not just the operations that matter, it's the programmer as well. So you as a programmer have to be there all the way to the production to deploy and monitor and improve your application. And the 12factor.net site 
gives you the tools you need to do that. It also happens to fit really well with this new technology called Kubernetes. Kubernetes is like a uh, process scheduler, but for the cloud. So instead of doing Terraform and then you get a new VM and you have to manually push every software up there, start it as a service and then monitor it, you can say, this is a service, it, expose, it exposes this port and it has these endpoints. Can you please deploy that for me uh, with a replica factor of three? And then Kubernetes goes and does that. So it's a hot recommendation to look into if you haven't yet. We also have this other pattern called server per test. It means that when you compose your application functionally, all of your side effects and all of your configuration is pushed up to your composition route, just like in C-sharp, where you have your IOC container. But that means that you can spawn a server with this config with the changes needed to run it as a unit test. So we have a library called suave.testing, which lets you spawn a server like this for each test. In this case, the run with on line eight takes the config, which is your adapted composition route and your application, and then starts it. It ensures that if the test fails, it'll shut it down again. And then you perform the action. You make a request on line nine with a get and no body, and then you pick out the status code from the reply. Then you can expect on it. This is using a testing framework called Expecto, um, which I've also written. Uh, which is a fork as well, so I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. But it lets you, in a nice, fluent manner, uh, say what you're expecting. And it lets you, just as Suave lets you treat your web parts as values, lets you treat your tests as values. This is what it can look like in the end. We also have a really nice community. This is one community contribution. Um, it uses something in f -sharp called type providers. So that when you create the code, which you uh, see on line 19 to 21, uh, you get the typed path. And you also get the compile time construct to interact with a typed path. In the end, you get generated swagger documentation. And all of these things compose orthogonally. So if you have your calculation function that does the processing of the web request, you can just shove it in here as part of the callback here. And then as it happens, you can on top of that layer the documentation. And that's really the strength of functional programming, the layering, the, comp uh, the composability. So this is all Suave. Uh, have a look at suave.swagger. And if you're interested in getting started, I recommend uh, suave.io, the website. There is uh, a whole book written uh, by the Milyuski called Suave Music Store. It was written as his, uh, as his PhD project, I think. It goes through everything from server-side page generation to logging to session types uh, to cryptography to some extent. Uh, there's been a book written called, um, so sorry, this is the book uh, Suave Music Store. There's also been a book written called f -sharp Applied. And it goes through how you would compose an application with f -sharp from scratch. He actually built Suave in uh, like 80 pages. And then uh, so he tells us, oh, so this is how it works. And now you know it because you built it yourself. Then he introduces the other tooling, like Paquette, uh, the one here at the top, a uh, Nugget Manager for .NET. That lets you uh, get away from one hour nugget packet update, um, PS prompt. Uh, there is a, um, a building tool chain called Fake, uh, also written in F sharp. That lets you build nice projects quite easily. Ionide, a free editor that runs as a plugin to VS Code. And finally, Rx to orchestrate uh, concurrent operations in the back end. Everything tied together with F sharp and swap. So besides that, it also gives you it also gives you the ability to do CQRS at the end. So he tries to tick them all. Uh, but it, it's nicely written, and it doesn't go overboard with it. We also have this really nice getting started toolkit called a web stack designed for developer happiness on GitHub. It's called Fable Suave Scaffold. So how many here have heard of Elm? Uh, 
All right, so that's like 80% of the room. You can actually write similar applications only on .NET with F Sharp and compile that F Sharp into stateless reactive UIs on the front end. So this web stack des designed for developer happiness lets you do that on the front end and then invoke typed roots on your server side with Swab. And then you can also have Swagger documentation, authentication. Yeah, you get the idea. And it runs on .NET Core as well. And if you're using Webpack, there is a Webpack loader for Fable, which the, is the compiler for F Sharp to JavaScript. So check it out. I've also written this course called the Linux Intro Course. Coming from a .NET background, I realized that many people don't actually publish their applications on Linux. They, they normally uh, paste it in RDP on IS. Um, but this is how you can get started. So it goes through everything from scratch. This is how you set up the terminal, and this is how you start a new project with uh, Forge, generating the f -sharp site, and then blah, 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 everything, up until you get to Kubernetes. This is how we operate systems at scale. This is how we do monitoring. Uh, it's on my GitHub as well, half slash Linux intro course. Uh, there are also videos. Uh, the last couple of years have had talks here at NDC about Swab. And um, uh, have a look at them. Now follows uh, a few more. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, there is this really cool eventing library that runs a state machine as a web server that lets you expose your IoT computer as a web API. Uh, and then you can also map the different API endpoints to the states that your hardware has. This presentation was built with FS Reveal. This is how you can do authentication with F Sharp. This is probably the, the most horrid monadic code I've ever written. But it does exactly one thing, and it's just a library, so you never have to read this code because it follows the specification as tested. You can run Web Sharper on Suave if you wanted to, uh, because Suave is also an OWIN server. And of course, that means you can run Identity Server, of course. Loggery, the logging framework I mentioned, you can do metrics and logging from your client side and push them into Swab and then push them into your logging backend. Uh, there is also this previous talk uh, about building a chat with Hopak and Swab, uh, which goes into how to use um, an old invention 40 years ago, no, actually 20 years ago, called Concurrent ML, uh, which we now have a port of to. Um, F sharp called Hopak. So lots more. Uh, what about the future? I want to increase uptake. That's why I'm standing here. I'm going to look at uh, GC performances uh, issues and also uh, how we can make a nicer parser. Because what you want from a system like this is um, uh, isomorphic code. You want something that both sends and receives uh, with similar logic. So then you might as well join and fuse um, your HTTP client with your server and have something which tests end-to-end uh, -end in your unit test with this pattern uh, server as a test. We're going to look into distributed persistent channels, similar to what Elixir does, so that you can have a load-balanced uh, chat server that keeps track of each client connection in case one goes down and also on that client connection, what subscriptions it had and what position of the log it had already read. Making channels uh, a first uh, primitive in, in uh, building web applications. So it's really trying to take it to the next level of distributed systems. So with all of these, we're looking for, um, uh, yeah, documentation. Um, we're looking into protocols. This is the client and server we could do some really nice testing if we did this. In the end, it comes down to speeding up the development with higher quality code. That's what I want to have as a takeaway from here. And if one of you is interested in, uh, in sponsoring Suave, perhaps as a company patron, that would be very appreciated. Uh, we could combine it with uh, courses and um, uh, you'd expect to see development speed ups. And that's from experience. And that's from other companies as well. So come talk to me. <laughs>
you can reach me here, hi at Kvitu, or on Twitter. So um, thank you um, very much. So now, do you have any questions before everyone leaves? All right, well, thank you for coming.